Good evening and welcome to the Four Lakes Church of Christ meeting in Madison, Wisconsin. We are so glad to have you with us tonight for our Wednesday evening Bible study. Today we return to our study of Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And tonight we start a brand new study of the book of Numbers. And so we want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with us to Numbers chapter 1. And we will be in Numbers chapter 1 in just a few moments. As always, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight, Tonight's class, feel free to chime in on the live stream. If you have something that we need to be praying about as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can send me a message to info at fourlakeschurch.org. You could also call or send a text to 608 224 0274. As I said, tonight we come to the book of Numbers. Now, just based on the title of the book in our English Bibles, uh, what might we think this book is about? Well, obviously, numbers. There are going to be some numbers in the book of Numbers, and in fact, we are introduced to what's going on here in the first three verses. So let's just jump right into it, and actually we'll look at the first four verses here, I believe. Numbers chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting on the first of the second month in the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel by their families, by their fathers' households, according to the number of names, every male, head by head, from twenty years old and upward, who able, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. With you, moreover, there shall be a man of each tribe, each one head of his father's household. And so as you see here in the opening verses, the book of Numbers is actually a book of numbers. So as they get ready to head out into the wilderness, uh, God wants Moses to number the people, that is to take a census. And we'll get back to that in just a moment. But we should just note here at the beginning that in the Hebrew Bible, the name of this book is in the wilderness. So they didn't call it the book of Numbers in the Hebrew Bible. They called it in the wilderness. So if you're familiar with this, they would often use either the opening line or maybe a phrase from the first verse to identify their books. And so this book was known as in the wilderness because we've got that phrase almost immediately up there in verse number one. By way of just very quick review, we know that Genesis then covers the period of time from creation to Joseph. Um, Exodus brings us from Moses up to the giving of the law. Leviticus covers the detailed instructions of the Levites concerning their duties as priests. This is what we just finished last Wednesday evening. Numbers now covers the time they spend in the wilderness. And Deuteronomy, meaning a second law or repetition of the law, describes Moses reviewing the law with the people right before he dies and before they cross over into the promised land without him under Joshua's leadership. And so that'll include the handoff from Moses to Joshua. As to the authorship of Numbers, who wrote this book? Uh, Jesus refers to Moses being the author of the first few books of the Bible. In John 5, 46 and 47, uh, Paul also refers to Moses being the author in Romans 10, verse 5. Uh, however, we also need to admit that there are some passages that seem to have been added by somebody else. The passage describing Moses' death, for example, I think that'd be at the top of the list of things Moses probably didn't write, uh, as well as the reference in Numbers, I believe, to Moses being the most humble man on the face of the earth. <laughs> It is hard to write something like that about yourself if you are truly the most humble man on the face of the earth. That's something you don't put in writing. Uh, but generally speaking, other than those few exceptions, Moses seems to be the author. Before we move on from the first verse, I should also point out a slight difference between Numbers 1.1 and Leviticus 1.1. And I mentioned this way back when we started Leviticus. Actually, not way back. We've been booking it through that book, and we made it through in record time. So it hasn't been that long, maybe a couple months ago. Uh, but Leviticus 1.1 starts by saying, Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. In other words, at the beginning of Leviticus, if you remember our discussion of this a couple months ago, God was calling out to Moses from inside the tent of meeting to Moses, who was apparently outside the tent of meeting. And now, in the book of Numbers, 
um, we have God calling out to Moses and he seems to be inside the tent of meeting. And so the book of Leviticus then is how to be holy, how to approach God in the tabernacle. And when we get to Numbers 1-1, the text says that God spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting. And so again, as I understand this, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I'd love to hear from you, but it seems that at some point between Leviticus 1 and Numbers 1, Moses has moved from outside the tent to inside the tent. And of course, we understand why. This is significant. God told the Levites how to approach him, and they're approaching him. They are now uh, coming on the job. They, they appear to be working. This, this relationship is getting closer. Uh, as to the timing of this, notice we have the note here that the book of Numbers starts on the first day of the second month on the second year after they had come out of the land of Egypt. And so if I've done the math correctly, this takes place 13 months after the Exodus, after that original Passover with the death of the firstborn. So over the past 13 months, they have left Egypt. They have crossed the Red Sea. They have received the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. They had constructed the tabernacle. They had received instructions from God concerning how to worship in it. And that brings us up to where we are tonight. <clears throat> Back to the numbers part of this. Notice in verse 2, God tells Moses to take a census. And the point of this is to have a record of those who are able to go to war. He wants specifically the numbers of the males from the age of 20 and upward who are able to fight. And God wants Moses and Aaron to number the people by their armies, that is, by their tribes. They are to bring some organization to the nation. They are coming out of a very chaotic situation, so they are to divide by tribe and take a number and uh, get a census, uh, kind of figuring out who we have here with us today. And today, of course, I think we also know the importance of taking a census. We take a census every 10 years here in the United States. Uh, primarily to recalculate how we're represented in Congress, but the census is also important when it comes to deciding how tax money is collected and how it's spent. So we need to know how many people are in each state and so on. As an election official, I am very aware of how the census changes our ward boundaries, even here down here in the city of Madison. So it's important that the wards are as evenly distributed as possible, and we can't know that without knowing exactly how many people live in various parts of this city. So a census is very important even today, uh, 3,400 or so years later. Well, in the ancient world, the purpose of a census was primarily and often to see who all is available to fight. And we're going to see this throughout the book. We, we will have one census at the beginning of the wilderness wanderings, and we'll have another census toward the end of the wilderness wandering. So we kind of got a before and after numbering of the people, a snapshot in time of their numbers before and after the 40 years in the wilderness. And we're going to have some pretty interesting and I think some very uh, important and rather dramatic events happen between these two uh, in the book of Numbers. Tonight, I just want us to do kind of a, a very quick overview of the first four chapters. We're not going to read every verse over the next four chapters. We're not taking that kind of time making our way through numbers. We're doing more of an overview. And um, so the, the first four chapters is basically uh, where God tells the people to take a census. And then he's going to have kind of some bonus information for the priest uh, immediately after that. Before we get too far here, I want to start tonight with one of my favorite cartoons. And I've shared this before <laughs> a time or two through the years, I'm sure, in the bulletin. We used to do more cartoons than we do. Leadership Magazine is no longer uh, publishing a hard copy. I don't even know if they're publishing online anymore. Uh, but this comes to us from Leadership Magazine a number of years back. And for those of you joining us on the phone who can't see this, it's a Bible class teacher apparently introducing a study of numbers. And various members of the class are, are protesting, why study the book of Numbers? 36 chapters of self-centered people who whined every time they didn't get their way. Give us something relevant. <laughs> and so the class is in chaos. And uh, to me, that is uh, absolutely hilarious. <laughs> we don't need the book of Numbers. At least they didn't think that they needed it. Anyway, before we dismiss the book of Numbers as being irrelevant like these guys are doing, um, I hope we realize that Paul in the New Testament actually uses several events from the book of Numbers as encouragement and as a warning for us today under the New Covenant. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1, this is what Paul says. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 1, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, <clears throat> that our fathers were all under the cloud, 
and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. So just going into this, let's anticipate, I think, learning some good lessons that have some real relevance for our lives today. This is not just a book that was written a long time ago that, that has no meaning to us. But, I mean, the Apostle Paul himself uh, very clearly ties it in. Uh, to some lessons that we need to learn in the church today. But we do need to start tonight with the census itself. So let's pick up with Numbers chapter 1, verses 5 through 19. And we're not going to read all of this, uh, but let's just note that in verses 5 through 16, the first chunk up here, God tells Moses the names of the men who, who are going to lead the various tribes. In other words, we have representatives from the tribe of Reuben in verse 5, the tribe of Simeon in verse 6, the tribe of Judah in verse 7, and so on. However, if you're looking at this list, and I hope that you are, do we see a problem here? Do we see a discrepancy? Do we understand that these 12 tribes do not perfectly match the 12 sons of Israel? Well, let's notice in this list there is no tribe of Levi, is there? However, we still have a total of 12. So what happened? We don't have a tribe of Joseph. But as we may remember from our previous studies, Joseph is replaced with his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. So they were given a double portion as being the children of the favorite son, we might say. And so there is no tribe of Levi. There is no tribe of Joseph. But the tribe of Joseph has been replaced with the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's two sons. So we still have a total of 12, and these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And now each tribe has a leader. Reuben and Simeon and Judah and the others, they have long since passed on. And so God now appoints a leader for each of these 12 tribes. So he's getting the people organized. He's getting them ready for what comes next. So let's skip down and then take a look at verses 17 through 19 where the text says this, So Moses and Aaron took these men who had been designated by name, and they assembled all the congregation together on the first of the second month. Then they registered by ancestry in their families, by their father's households, according to the number of names, from twenty years old and upward, head by head, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. So he numbered them in the wilderness of Sinai. So we find then that everybody gets together. Moses numbers the people exactly as God had instructed him to do. And we actually have a list of the census numbers by tribe in verses uh, 20 through 42. And we're, we are not going to read all of those names and numbers. But since we're doing an overview, let's just kind of fast forward, skipping down to verse 44. So we're not reading how many thousands were in each particular tribe. I don't think there's a whole lot of real relevance for us today. I'm not really losing uh, sleep over that. I, th I think there's not much practical there. But let's skip down to verse 44. This is where Moses gives a summary of his own. So this is kind of what we need to know about it. Numbers 1, 44 through 46. The text says this. These are the ones who were numbered from Moses and Aaron number, whom Moses and Aaron numbered with the leaders of Israel, 12 men, each of whom was of his father's household. So all the numbered men of the sons of Israel by their father's households from 20 years old and upward, whoever was able to go out to war in Israel, even all the numbered men were 603,550. So when everybody's numbered, the number of men 20 years old and older comes to 603,550. That's a big number. 
Well, let's realize this does not include the women and the children. So some have suggested a grand total of somewhere between two to three million people. That's a lot of people. The last time I checked, the population of the city of Chicago was somewhere around 2.8 million. And so I'm just saying that when I try to picture the Israelites in the wilderness, I try to picture the entire city of Chicago gathered together in one place in the wilderness. It is a huge group of people. And I would also point out that these people are camping. They are not in a city. They are out in the middle of nowhere. So they're going to need food and water and sanitation. And above all, they will need leadership. This is a huge challenge. And Moses starts following God's instructions by appointing leaders for each of those 12 tribes and making sure he knows how many people they're actually dealing with. All right, so the Levites are not in that number. So for the Levites, let's take a look at the end of this chapter. And let's pick up with Numbers chapter 1, verses 47 through 54. Numbers 1, 47 through 54. The Levites, however, were not numbered among them by their father's tribe. For the Lord had spoken to Moses, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not number, nor shall you take their census among the sons of Israel. But you shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all its furnishings and over all that belongs to it. They shall carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings, and they shall take care of it. They shall also camp around the tabernacle. So when the tabernacle is to set out, the Levite shall take it down, and when the tabernacle encamps, the Levite shall set it up. But the layman who comes near shall be put to death. The sons of Israel shall camp, each man by his own camp, and each man by his own standard, according to their armies. But the Levite shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony, so that there will be no wrath in the congregation of the sons of Israel. So the Levite shall keep charge of the tabernacle of the testimony, thus the sons of Israel did according to all which the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. Well, what we learn here is that the Levites were not numbered with the rest because they're given the special responsibility of taking care of the tabernacle. The Levites were not warriors. They were not to fight the battles. They were responsible for carrying the tabernacle through the wilderness. That is their job. That is their primary responsibility setting it up, taking it down. They are to camp immediately, surrounding the tabernacle itself, surrounding it. Uh, they were almost, as I would see it, like a buffer between God and the people. That's the role of a priest, a, a go-between. And literally, they were go-betweens. They were between the people and the Lord in the tabernacle. And notice, according to verse 51, what is to happen if a non-Levite just walks up to the tabernacle? Hey, let me help set this thing up. They're to be put to death. And so this is incredibly serious, and God makes that warning here. So let's continue over into Numbers chapter 2 now, and let's look at verses 1 and 2 to begin with. Numbers 2, verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, The sons of Israel shall camp, each by his own standard, with the banners of their father's households. They shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. And so in Numbers 2, then, God explains how he wants the tribes to camp. And let's notice, everybody is arranged around the tent of meeting. So they are radiating out like uh, spokes from a, a hub of a wheel, and they are to camp at a distance. So we've got the tabernacle in the, in the middle. We've got the Levites camping immediately around the tabernacle as a buffer. And then we have everybody else just spread out in all different directions. And in the rest of this chapter, God gives some specifics concerning the arrangement of the tribes around the tabernacle. Well, we know that the tabernacle itself faces to the east. And so <clears throat> on that east side, in verses 3 through 9, we have Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Then in the south side, in verses 10 through 16, we have Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. On the west side of the tabernacle, in verses 18 through 24, we have Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. And then on the north side, in verses 25 through 31, we have Dan, and Asher, and Naphtali. And then in verse 34, we find that the people actually obey these instructions. Thus the sons of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses, so they camped by their standards, 
And so they set out, every one by his family, according to his father's household. Notice the reference to uh, standards or banners. So they would have had flags, it seems like to me, representing their tribes. And so they would know where to go uh, at the end of each day. Well, let's continue into Numbers 3 now by looking at the first 10 verses of chapter 3. Numbers 3, 1 through 10. Now these are the records of the generations of Aaron and Moses at the time when the Lord spoke to Moses on, or with Moses on Mount Sinai. These then are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab the firstborn, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the, appointed, the anointed priest, whom he ordained to serve as priests. But Nadab and Abihu died before the Lord when they offered strange fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. So Eleazar and Ithamar served as priests in the lifetime of their father Aaron. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and set them before Aaron the priest, that they may serve him. They shall perform the duties for him and for the whole congregation before the tent of meeting, to do the service of the tabernacle. They shall also keep all the furnishings of the tent of meeting, along with the duties of the sons of Israel, to do the service of the tabernacle. You shall thus give the Levites to Aaron and to his sons, they are wholly given to him from among the sons of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons that they may keep their priesthood. But the layman who comes near shall be put to death. Well, basically, the remainder of Numbers chapters 3 and 4 is a breakdown of the numbers and the various families within the Levites who are given some very specific responsibilities. Uh, here in the first two paragraphs, God reminds the Levites that Aaron is in charge and that the Levites are given to Aaron to serve Aaron in accomplishing the mission of leading the nation in worship. And it's a huge job. It's so big, in fact, that they are exempted from military service. Uh, most of the middle of this chapter and continuing into chapter 4 is a description of various responsibilities that were given to different families within the Levites. And so it was broken down. One family within the Levites was responsible for putting the sockets together. One family was responsible for hanging the curtains in the tabernacle. One guy had to put up the covering over the tabernacle. One family was responsible for taking out the ashes. One family was responsible for packing up the utensils. One family was responsible for filling up the oil in the lampstand, and on and on and on. And so those duties were broken down. We also have several little sections in this chapter where God explains that the Levites are taking the place of the firstborn from all the other tribes. As I understand it, all of the firstborn from all of the tribes belong to the Lord. They are set apart to serve the Lord. However, the Levites pretty much take their place. And I think that makes sense logistically. I think it would certainly make more sense uh, from that point of view, from a leadership point of view, for one tribe to be responsible for leading and serving in worship instead of the firstborn from every tribe. Because it'd be hard to communicate among the tribes like that. But for whatever reason, God pretty much makes this substitution. So the Levites are swapped in for the firstborn of every tribe for leadership and worship. We can skip down to Numbers chapter 3, verse 39. We'll find that the males in the tribe of Levi number 22,000. And the division of responsibility for serving in the tabernacle continues down almost through all of chapter 4. So we're not taking the time to look at the details of, of who gets to hang each curtain and who puts the porpoise skin on top when they camp for the night. We're not looking at, at all of that. We're not reading every verse. So let's just skip ahead and let's end tonight with a summary of this as it's given in Numbers 4, verses 46 through 49. Numbers 4, 46 through 49. All the numbered men of the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron and the leaders of Israel numbered by their families and by their father's households, from 30 years and upward, even to 50 years old, everyone who could enter to do the work of service and the work of carrying in the tent of meeting, their numbered men were 8,580. According to the commandment of the Lord through Moses, they were numbered every one by his serving or carrying. Thus, these were his numbered men, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Here at the end, we find that the age for serving in the tabernacle was from 30 to 50. So they couldn't serve until the age of 30, and they had to retire at the age of 50. If you remember from that previous passage, there were 22,000 men in the tribe of Levi, but there are only 
8,580 now between the ages of 30 and 50. By the way, who else started his ministry at the age of 30? Jesus did, didn't he? Jesus wasn't a Levite, but he did serve as a priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And we don't have time to look into that tonight in great detail. We just studied through the whole book of Hebrews last year. But it's interesting to me that Jesus starting his ministry at the age of 30 does not seem to be random. He seems to be following the custom of the Old Testament. By 30, I think most Levites would have, time, uh, would have had time to observe those who had gone on before them. So from the time you were kind of spiritually aware, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, up until the time of 30, you'd be observing your older brothers, your father, your, your uncles, and so on, and what they were doing and the seriousness with which they took their duty. And so you would have that time to observe and kind of get the process down. And then also, I think we understand that most people should have a pretty good sense of maturity at the age of 30. Uh, not everybody's mature by 30, I suppose, but uh, 30 is an age when most people are, are starting really to get life under control and starting to kind of figure things out and uh, starting to be perhaps more spiritually serious, having children and, and looking at the prospect of raising them in the Lord and, and so on. Things are getting serious uh, at the age of 30. Uh, but this was difficult and somewhat demanding work, wasn't it? I mean, you are slaughtering animals, wrestling bulls and holding goats down and slitting throats and draining blood and carrying firewood and ushering people in and out all day long. It was hard, hard work to do. So I also want us to notice that God put the upper age, the age of retirement at 50 for those who were actually doing that difficult service in the tabernacle. So I am now too old officially to serve as a priest in the tabernacle, but they would serve from the age of 30 on up to the age of 50. Well, that brings us to the end of the first four chapters of the book of Numbers. So next week, Lord willing, let's plan on picking up with Numbers chapter 5, and we might make it as far as Numbers 10. That looks to be the next kind of breakdown. We'll see how it goes. Uh, there is some significant stuff in Numbers chapters 5 through 10, so we'll see how far we get. Feel free to read ahead and prepare for that. As always, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I know it's a sacrifice of your time, but if there's something we need to be praying about, if there's some way that we can help you or encourage you as a church, uh, we invite you to reach out to us by sending an email, info at fourlakeschurch.org. You can also give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. As we close tonight, let's go to God together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we know that you are a holy God, and we know that worship is so serious. Back in the tabernacle in the wilderness it was, but certainly also especially today. And we're thankful, Father, that you have made us a kingdom of priests to serve you. Although we are not from the tribe of Levi, we know that we've been born into your family. And we're thankful for the awesome privilege that comes along with reaching out to a lost and dying world, preaching the love of Jesus that you have shown to us in your Son. Thank you, Father, for making us a part of your kingdom, the church. We love you, and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.